In this video, I am going to describe Raven's algorithm for finding roots of a polynomial over a finite field, and also the cantor zassen house algorithm for factoring polynomials over finite fields. Um, these are two of my absolute favorite algorithms. They're both probabilistic algorithms of Las Vegas type, and they use randomness in a very non-trivial way to give efficient solutions to problems for which we know no deterministic polynomial time algorithm. Uh, these algorithms are widely used. They're implemented in virtually every computer algebra system, including Sage. Um, and they're also used widely in cryptography. In fact, there's a decent chance your phone just ran Raven's algorithm to find a root of a polynomial over a finite field, at least within the last few minutes. So I'm, I'm doing this in a Jupyter notebook using the Sage math kernel. I've included a link to the notebook down below if you want to follow along, and also a link to the lecture notes, which uh, gives a lot more of the mathematical details behind um, the algorithms I'm going to describe. Okay, so let's get started. So our problem is we have a polynomial f over a finite field fq, and we want to find the fq rational roots of it. So to keep things simple, let's start with uh, q a prime, say q at p, a prime p, say 61. I'm going to set up the, the finite field fp to find a polynomial ring over fp and the variable x. And then let's consider a polynomial, say this one, x to the eighth minus 2x plus 5. So I'll just click shift enter to run that cell. Now I've got my polynomial and let's go ahead and see what its roots are. Sage already knows how to compute them. And it's fact, it's using Raven's algorithm to do that. And it says there are three rational roots. Now F has degree eight. So that means there are five other roots living over some extension. If we wanted to see where they live, we could factor F and see that it's a product of three linear Polynomials, a quadratic and a cubic. So two roots live over a quadratic extension and three live over a cubic extension. And if we wanted to see all eight roots of our degree eight polynomial, we'd have to go to a degree six extension, which we can do. So now I'm just going to base change my polynomial F to the field FP to the six, and then ask Sage to compute the roots there. And it'll give us back all eight roots, the three rational roots, can't exactly tell by looking at them, but two of these roots live over a quadratic extension and three live over a cubic extension. And our strategy for finding these roots is going to exploit a very basic fact about finite fields. In fact, it's baked into the definition, which is that they are splitting fields of polynomials of the form x to the q minus x. Um, this is true even when q is a prime p. The fact that uh, fp is the splitting field of xp, x to the p minus x is just Fermat's little theorem. And for uh, extensions of fp, well, this is actually how we defined those extensions. And in the notes, you'll see a proof that um, this agrees with other definitions you may have heard of. In particular, if you take any irreducible polynomial of degree d, its splitting field is going to be exactly the same splitting field as the splitting field of x to the q to the d minus x. Okay, so what, what good does that do us? Well, first let's just note that I could use Sage to check this, at least in some small examples. So for our finite field F61, I could check that the product of all the linear polynomials over F61 is in fact equal to X to the P minus X. And it's not just for prime fields, I could do the same thing over FP squared. It takes a little bit longer because there's more elements. So an immediate corollary of this description of our finite fields is that, um, if we take the greatest common divisor of our polynomial f with a polynomial of the form x to the q to the n minus x, the roots of that polynomial is going to be a product of linear factors corresponding to the roots of f that live in the field fq to the n. And in particular, the cardinality of this set, the roots of f in fq to the n, which is, is going to be just equal to the degree of this GCD, which we can compute using the fast Euclidean algorithm in quasi-linear time, quasi-linear in, in, in the exponent and in the size, the bit size of our finite field. Okay. So we could give this a shot. Let's see if we can um, see how, let, let's first see how long this takes to compute the GCD of F with X to the P minus X. I realize P is very small here, so you're probably not, impressed, but I'm starting with p small because I want to show you that we can actually get into, a, into trouble pretty quickly, even with a small value of p if we're not careful. So I'm checking, taking GCDs with 
x to the p minus x to get the rational roots over fp over fp squared over fp cubed. Let's try it over fp to the six. Okay. So I'm I'm waiting. I'm looking at my watch. I'm I'm wondering what Sage is doing. Um, I see this little circle here, so I know it's trying to do something. It's it's not flashing red, so the CPU isn't isn't getting hot. I'm not sure what's going on. Well, let's go ahead and kill this. Let's go ahead and stop it for a minute and see what's happening. Okay, so we get a, a trace back telling us where it was, and I'm not going to get into the details of this, but what the, what it's trying to do is it actually hasn't even started the computation. It's still busy trying to construct this polynomial. Why would that be hard? It's only got two terms. Well, if we're going to use a dense representation of polynomials, which we'll really need to do, if we're going to compute this GCD. I mean, recall, we're going to compute this by doing Euclidean, in Euclidean divisions. I mean, we're, we're trying to compute a remainder, but the first step in doing that is computing the quotient. And even if the, even if the original polynomial is sparse, the quotient is no reason to be sparse. What's the degree of this polynomial? Well, it's something like 61 to the six. That's uh, something like, you know, it's well over a billion. Um, and so we are going to need memory for several billion entries in FQ in order to even write down this polynomial, never mind actually compute with it. And so reasonably enough, um, CoCalc is having a hard time doing that. It's actually protecting itself from even, and from even letting, letting us run this. So what's the problem here? The problem here is that we're exponentiating in the wrong ring. We're doing this computation of x to this huge exponent, p to the sixth, and, and it'll get huger in a minute. This p is a small p. Um, but we don't want to do that exponentiation over FQ. We would be much better, because remember, we're ultimately only, we want to take this GCD, so it would be just as well to work in the polynomial ring mod F. And that's where we should be doing our exponentiation. So recall we have a, a reduction map from the polynomial ring over FQ to the, the, polynom the ring we get when we take the quotient of this ring by the ideal generated by F. Now, F is not irreducible here, so this isn't a field, but it is a ring, and we have a well-defined ring homomorphism. And we can use this ring homomorphism. We could apply it to the, our polynomial x to the q minus x, and we're just going to get the ring homomorphism, the reduction of x into this uh, quotient ring raised to the q power minus its reduction. And because it's a ring homomorphism, these are mathematically equivalent. Um, but the right-hand side of this equation here can be computed exponentially faster than the left-hand side. Because when we're working in this quotient ring, we're never going to need to deal with polynomials of degree greater than the degree of f. So all of our computations here will be working with polynomials of degree at most seven, Okay, which is a good thing. And the point here is that the complexity of computing x to the q mod f using the standard algorithm for Euclidean division is going to be quasi-linear in the degree q which could be exponent, you know, could be cryptographically large. Whereas the complexity of computing the qth power of the reduction of x in this quotient ring using binary exponentiation is quasi-linear in the logarithm of the exponent q, so exponentially faster. Okay, so let's go ahead and give this a try. So to define the quotient map, I'm actually going to define the quotient. So I, I do this by taking r, the, the polynomial ring r has a method called quotient, I can pass in f and it's just going to form precisely the ring I've written down here. I'm, I, I, so the, the result is another ring, but I've, I've made it, named it pi f to suggest to you that we should really think of this as a reduction map. Um, because when I apply pi f to an element, it's going to reduce, I can plug in any value of r and pi f of that value will lie in this quotient ring. Okay, so let's try again to see if we can compute um, at least part of the computation we're going to do, the first step of computing this GCD would be to exponentiate x to the p to the sixth power. So I could try that again here. <clears throat> and now I see, oops, wait a second, Sage still seems to be getting stuck here. I'm not getting an answer. And then I realized, oh, I forgot to move the parentheses. I'm on the left-hand side of this equality and I wanted to be on the right-hand side. So let's go ahead and stop it again. We need another trace back, I'm stuck in the same place. And now I'm going to get an exponential speed up by simply moving a parenthesis. I'm going to move this parenthesis over here. Okay, now let's try it. Wow, it took a millisecond. So we went from a computation that was completely infeasible, running out of memory on CoCalc to something that takes uh, less than a millisecond. And what's the result? Well, it's not, shouldn't be too surprising to you that if, 
if we're exponentiating to the p to the sixth power, we're applying the Frobenius automorphism to x, we're just going to get back x, which is now called um, x bar to denote the reduction of x into this quotient ring. Sage helpfully picks a name for the variable here that is to remind us that it's not the same x anymore. Okay, now let's let's try this on in, with a bigger finite field. Let's take say p is two to the two fifty five minus nineteen. So and I'll use the same polynomial again, and I'll set up my quotient ring again. And we'll go ahead and see how this polynomial factors over this field. The factorization is a little different now. We get one linear factor, a quadratic factor, and a degree five factor. <clears throat> and now we can easily compute all of these uh, exponentiations in our, in our quotient ring um, very efficiently, even for a large prime like two to the 55 minus 19. So all of these computations just took a handful of, of milliseconds. Excuse me, now we're not getting just x bar because, um, excuse me, we would need to go all the way up to, I guess, a degree 10 extension. We could try this again. Yeah, so we would go all the way up to the um, degree 10 extension of FP, where now this polynomial splits completely. Oh. <clears throat> we get our x bar again. Okay. All right. So now we have an algorithm, uh, our first algorithm, our first actual algorithm, which is already a very useful thing. Um, without using any randomness, just by computing the cardinality of this, um, we can compute the cardinality of this set S, the set of uh, FQ to the n rational points of F by taking a GCD, the degree of a GCD. Okay, so let's go ahead and implement an algorithm for doing that. Okay. okay, and so I've, I've done this here. Um, so the, the, the function of interest is going to be count distinct roots. And all it's going to do is compute a polynomial and take its degree. And the polynomial it's going to be compute is precisely the GCD of F with X to the Q minus X. But let's just take a look to understand how it's doing that computation in order to make sure we're on the right-hand side of the equality rather than the left. So it takes in a polynomial F F here knows over what field it lives. So F dot base ring is just going to be FQ. And if I wanted to know what Q is, I could ask for the cardinality of that base ring. Then I'm going to go ahead and compute my reduction map. Um, so F dot parent just means the polynomial ring containing F. So this was the R above, but since I want my, my function to just take in a single argument F, I can, we can, I can grab R from F, F knows its parent and take the quotient. And then I'm going to compute, I want to compute x to the q minus x. Now the subtlety here is um, I want to take the GCD in the polynomial ring over fq, but I want to do the computation, this exponentiation in the quotient ring. So I take pi f of x, that's going to give me my x bar in the quotient ring. I'm going to raise it to the qth power. This is still in the quotient ring. And then I'm going to use the lift method of the element of the quotient ring I get to return an element of the parent ring. So and whenever I define a quotient like this, I can always apply lift. We don't know which lift it's going to take. It's only going to be well-defined modulo f because of course this, this reduction is just an equivalence class. Lift is just asking for a, rep a representative of that equivalence class. But because we're about to take a GCD, we don't care with f, we don't care which representative it is. Um, it'll actually be the unique representative of degree less than f. And then we want to remember to subtract x. So we get our polynomial x to the q minus x reduced mod f in this expression here. And then we take the GCD. Okay, so let's go ahead and give this a try. So now I've, in this line, what I've noticed, I've, I've gone back to our small finite field, uh, p is 61, set up the finite field and our polynomial ring again redefined our polynomial because I changed it to live over a, a different field and uh, a few cells above. Defining our um, quotient map here. Um, <clears throat> actually, this definition isn't even needed at this point. I can just delete it. And I'm then going to count roots on our finite field of our polynomial over various extensions of FP. Okay, and I'll go ahead and just run this again so we can see it in action. And you'll see there are three roots over FP. Those are the three that we saw earlier. 
um, there are five roots over fp squared. Excuse me, I'm realizing that this um, display here is not very useful. Let's go ahead and fix it. Okay, so over f61, we have three roots. Over f61 squared, we have five roots because of course the three roots that are defined over f61 are still there. Plus we get two new ones, the two that lived over quadratic extension. Over f61 cubed, well, we lose the roots that were defined over a quadratic extension because those aren't inside f61 cubed, but we have the three that were defined over fp and then three new ones that are the root of the irreducible cubic factor of f. <clears throat> over f4, we're going to again see the quadratic, the roots defined over quadratic extension because f61 squared is a subfield of f61 to the fourth over f61 to the fifth. We only see the, the fp rational roots. And then finally over f61 to the sixth, we get all eight roots. Okay. So just with this very short bit of, co of code here, um, we can count roots, the number of roots a polynomial has over any extension of its base field. Great. And sometimes that may be all we all we need to do. And in fact, if there was only one root, we would actually know what it is because this, this distinct root poly would be a linear polynomial. We could extract its root. Okay, in fact, let's so let's go ahead and um, look at what the polynomial is. So over f61, when I take the GCD of f with x to the 61 minus x, I get this cubic polynomial. And this cubic polynomial is precisely the product of the linear factors of f corresponding to the three rational roots that live over fp. But you know, maybe over f61, if I stare long enough at this cubic, I can figure out what the roots are. But if this was a large finite field, knowing what the polynomial, the coefficients of the polynomial is, doesn't tell me what the roots are, even if it's a degree polynomial, even if it's a very simple one, like say, I don't know, x squared minus seven. What's the square root of seven or the two square roots of seven, say in, fp where p is 2 to the 255 minus 19. That's not an easy problem to solve. Um, in the case of 7, there is an efficient algorithm to solve it doing to Rene scope, which we'll see a little later. But if I replaced 7 with a much larger number, it would be there would be no deterministic polynomial time algorithm known for solving that problem. So how, do we, how are we going to solve it? Well, our first strategy is to try and change the polynomial we're taking a GCD with. So let's try instead of x to the p minus x, let's try x to the s minus x, or let's just let's factor out the x. I mean, if we had if if zero is a root of our polynomial, that's easy to tell the constant term is zero. So let's forget about the root zero and just focus on on uh, the non-zero roots. And I'm going to take s to be p minus one over two. Now I'm assuming that p and and more generally q is odd. There are similar algorithms one could use in even characteristic, but let's not worry about them for the purpose of this video. <clears throat> And let's try computing this GCD again. And lo and behold, we find that we get a smaller GCD. So this, this quadratic divides this cubic. In fact, if I did the division, I could get the other linear polynomial and know what one of the roots is. is. So this, by taking a GCD with a different polynomial, we were able to split this polynomial, which was a product of the, of the linear factors of f. So that's great. And so why did I choose this particular value, this particular polynomial, x to the s minus 1 with s as p minus 1 over 2? Well, I mean, this in, in one reason is, well, it has roughly, it has exactly half the non-zero roots of fp are going to be roots of x to the s minus 1. Which half is it? Well, I could, I could print them out since 61 is not so big, and I could stare at those. And maybe my spidey sense tells me that those look like squares. At least I see 4, 9, and 16 here. Or I could just remember Euler's criterion, which tells me that the roots of x to the p minus 1 over 2 minus 1 are precisely the quadratic residues in the multiplicative group of fp. Um, and in fact, I could even verify that that's true. Indeed, it is. OK, so that's great um, in situations where maybe there's only one quadratic residue or, or one non-residue. But in general, um, what do we do if we, we find ourselves stuck as we are here at this point? Suppose we want to split this quadratic. Well, the, both roots are quadratic residues. Now, what are we going to do? And this is where Rabin's idea comes in. 
and where randomness becomes critical. So now instead of the polynomial u s, x to the s minus one, we're gonna just translate x, just shift it over by delta and use the same polynomial, but our shift is gonna be a random element of our finite field. Okay. And our hope is that when we take a shift, we're sort of, we, you can imagine we're sort of moving all the quadratic residues around in what would seem like a random way. And our hope would be that by trying different random values of delta, we have a good chance of being able to split um, a polynomial that we know is a product of linear factors. Okay. And it's not hard to prove that this actually is indeed the case, that this works. Um, formally, the way you can find that proof of this for in the lecture notes or in Raven's paper, um, we'll say that two elements of our finite field FQ are of different type if they're both non-zero and when we raise them to the S power, we don't get the same answer. Here, S is gonna be Q minus one over two. Now, of course, when we raise a non-zero alpha or beta to the s power, we, we're always going to get plus or minus one. Just to, to say these are non-equal means one of them is one and one of them is minus one. In other words, one's a quadratic residue and the other one isn't. Okay. And the key theorem that drives all this is that if we just pick any two, doesn't matter which two, because we remember we don't have control necessarily over alpha and beta. Maybe these are the roots of the polynomial that was given to us. If we just shift them both by a random delta they're going to wind up being of different type half the time. And uh, I'll refer you to the lecture notes for proof, but it's really just four or five lines. And so as a consequence of this, um, if we take the GCD, uh, if we first get a product of the linear factors of F by taking the GCD with X to Q minus X, call that G. And then we take the GCD of G that we know to be a product of linear factors with the polynomial x plus delta the s minus one where delta is chosen at random, we have at least a 50% chance of finding a non-trivial factor of G, by which I mean the, the, this GCD will not be constant and it will not be equal to B, G, it'll be a proper divisor of G. Okay, and so here's the algorithm called rational root that looks for a rational root of the input polynomial f. And it does this by initially taking the GCD with x to the q minus x to get a product of linear factor of the, that we know factors completely over fq. And then it tries to randomly split it. So let's take a look at the, at the um, algorithm. Maybe one important note here, if you're not completely up to speed on Python 3, when we're doing this division, um, s equals q minus 1 we want s to be q minus one over two. I'm using the double slash operator. This denotes integer division. This makes sure that we actually get an integer, even though we know q minus one is exactly divisible by two. We even verify this. Um, we want to get an integer and not a rational number. Otherwise, Sage will complain when we try to exponentiate to a rational number, even when that rational number happens to be an integer. Okay, so now we've defined our s. We put in a trivial check to say, well, if the constant coefficient of f is zero, then we know it has zero as a root. We could just retake that one. Otherwise, we're going to compute this distinct root poly again. That was just the GCD of f with x to q minus x. And that's going to give us our g, which would now be a cubic polynomial for our sample degree 8 f. And now we want to split g. And we're going to do that by going through a loop where, where our goal is to get um, a g that has um, degree 1. Or it could be that there are no rational roots, in which case g might have degree 0, and, we, and we'll know that we have no roots. And so we're gonna split G by picking a random delta using the random element method of our finite field, which is just a Q, which is just the base ring of G. Then we're gonna take our GCD of G with X plus delta the S minus one. And we're gonna do that computation correctly inside our quotient ring. Pi G here is the quotient map for our defined, the quotient of F Q bracket X by G. Raise it to the S power minus one, lift as before. And then we're going to check, do we get a polynomial whose degree is strictly between zero and the degree of G? If we do, we found a proper divisor of, of, of G. And now our strategy is, well, we could either try to find a root, we're going to recursively either try to find a root of H, or if H has degree that's greater than half the degree of G, we might as well instead switch to the other factor, take G divided by H and look for a rational root of that quotient. Okay, and so we now have found a smaller G. Um, we're actually not using recursion here, I guess. We're just running in a loop. We're just replacing G with our smaller G. Excuse me. 
And we're redefining our quotient map here, our pi, pi sub g, because we're going to use it again in this loop. And this is going to keep going until either, um, well, if we ever got into this loop in the first place, we're going to keep, we know at the end we're going to have a polynomial of degree one, because we're always finding a proper divisor in this step here. Otherwise, we don't get out of the loop. And the loop is going to continue until g has degree one. Okay, and then at the end, we're going to return either the root of our linear polynomial, if we have one, or the other possibility is we never entered the loop at all because g was trivial to begin with, in which case we know there are no rational roots. And it's not hard to show that, um, well, we know we have a 50-50 chance of splitting our polynomial g. In the worst case, g might have the same degree as, as f. And because we're always taking the smaller of the two factors, we know we're cutting the degree in half in each step. And so, and we expect that to happen after two random choices. And so we expect the depth, the depth of the recursion should be logarithmic, um, excuse me, in the degree. And so the total running time of this algorithm, up if we ignore um, log log factors of Q and logarithmic factors of degree, it's going to be soft O of n squared D. So n here is the number, the bit size of our finite field. I mean, there's an n here because we need to write down elements of our finite field. And then there's another n because we're doing exponentiation, but with exponents that have roughly n bits in them. And then we have a d for the degree. So quadratic, quasi-quadratic in n, quasi-linear in d. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and give this a shot. Okay, so just to see it in action on our, our polynomial f, let's go ahead and just run it five times just so we can see the randomness coming into play here. So at each, in each iteration, I'm printing out the initial GCD of f with x to the q minus x, which is a cubic polynomial. And I'm telling you which delta it picked in this iteration, in this case, first time through, it picked five. And that five was good. It split, it split this polynomial and it found into a degree one and a degree two, and it took the degree one factor x plus 46 and it output the root corresponding to that factor. In the next run, the first delta it tried, 13 didn't work. So it tried another one, delta was 54, that one worked. And this time, oh, it didn't find the same root it found before, it found a different root. And similarly in the, in the other try, actually in the next three tries, it, it succeeded on the first try. It never took more than two random deltas to split. Okay, let's just maybe to see the, uh, the power of this algorithm, let's, let's use a, a higher degree polynomial. Let's take, say, a polynomial degree 19 that we know has 19 rational roots. Let's just take the, the product of x minus i for i from 1 up to 19 and run our algorithm a bunch of times on that. So here we can see our, our initial GCD was the entire polynomial because we constructed h to be a product of linear polynomials. We get pick our first delta. And note, now that we've got lots of linear polynomials, we actually have a much better than 50-50 chance of splitting. In fact, and it's very unlikely we won't split. Um, and on average, we should expect to split roughly in half. And, and that happens. In this case, we split, we get a degree nine polynomial and a degree 10, we take the degree nine. And the next iteration, we split it five, four, we take the degree four, then we split it two, two, and then we get a linear polynomial and we output that one. And you can see some other runs here. Maybe it doesn't always split nine, 10 the first time, this time it splits seven, 12, and then three, four, and then two, one. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Okay. Now, at this point, you might not be so impressed. I mean, this is a finite field of with 61 elements in it. How hard can it be to find roots? Well, let's try a bigger finite field. Let's take one of my favorites, two to the 61 minus one, Marison prime, and we'll apply it to the same polynomial, x to the eight minus two x plus five, which now maybe has a different factorization pattern. <clears throat> uh, oh, sorry. Actually, I'm I'm uh, in this. I'm again applying it to h. The the product of the x minus i for i from 1 to 19, which is maybe lets you see more of the algorithm in action better. And so as before, we now have this initial polynomial, which is degree 19, the whole thing, the coefficients are just bigger now. Um, we pick a random delta with roughly 61 bits in it. It splits 6, 13. Next random delta splits at 1, 5. So that was great. It only took two iterations. And some of the other, uh, other runs, it takes more than two iterations, but in every case, we descend to a root very quickly, logarithmic. The, the depth of the recursion, again, is logarithmic in the degree. OK, and you can see that even over this, well, not quite cryptographic size field, but decent size field, um, it only takes a few millise milliseconds. And heck, we could, we could try this over a cryptographic size field if we wanted to. Um, just 
the screen will get a little uglier, but it won't take any noticeably longer. Um, so yeah, actually I'm gonna switch back to my other field because I think I'm assuming I'm set up in the sort of our word size field later on. Okay, great. So that's a way to find a rational root. What if we want to know what all the rational roots are? That, that is, we want to know the complete set S of, of say, FQ, FQ or FQ to the N rational roots of F. Well, we can easily modify the algorithm we just wrote to do that. Instead of, we were just picking one half of the, of the, of the descent as we were splitting our polynomial, we could just descend on both halves. So this is just essentially a rewrite of the algorithm above. Um, the only difference now is I am actually going to use a recursive algorithm since I want to follow uh, both paths down the tree. Um, as before, I'm going to, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to pull out uh, zero if it's a root, just treat that special, get it out of the way up front. And if the input, because I'm, this is a recursive algorithm, I need to handle the base case. The base case is going to be that um, G is, uh, it has degree at most one, meaning it's either linear, in which case I just pull out a root, or <clears throat> um, it has degree zero, in which case it has no roots, and I just return an empty list. But in, the, uh, in every other case, if the degree is greater than one, then I'm going to go into a loop where I'm just going to pick a random delta. I'm going to use it to try and split um, my polynomial G, and whenever I succeed, I'm then going to recursively find all the rational roots of both H and G divided by H. Okay. All right. And let's go ahead and compile this. And the nice thing is this doesn't really change the running time of the algorithm. I mean, by finding both, by following both paths, we increase the amount of work we're doing by a factor of log D, but that's gonna get lost in our soft O notation. So if, you, if we're not, unless we're keeping track of log factors, finding all the rational roots takes no more time really than finding just one of them. So let's go ahead and um, try it. Um, so here was in this case over, uh, P is to the 61 minus one, F only had one rational root and it finds it. So maybe that's not so exciting. Let's run it instead where we find um, all the rational roots of a polynomial we've constructed to have say 10 rational roots. And I'm just gonna make them random and let's let it go find them. And so you can see it's very quick. I could run it again, no, you know, nothing up my sleeves. Numbers change each time. The algorithm is very efficient, okay. So now we have a probabilistic algorithm for finding all the rational roots of a polynomial over a finite field. Now, strictly speaking, it, well, it is finding all the rational roots, but it's not telling us their multiplicity. So if, if F had a repeated root, the number of roots, the, the length of the list returned by distinct rational roots might be less than the degree of F. And maybe we want to know the multiplicities of the roots as well. So, well, we could just jigger the algorithm we've already written to do that by just trying checking each root we find to see if it, um, by dividing out a linear factor of, of our polynomial and then checking to see if, and then checking to see if it's a repeated factor we could just evaluate at, at the root. And that's actually reasonably efficient, but it's not the most efficient thing to do. We can actually do better. Um, and that's, we can do better by computing the square free factorization. So this is uh, with an algorithm uh, due to Yun. So let me first define the square free factorization. So if we have, uh, I'll just define it for monic polynomials. You can put a constant out front if you don't want your polynomial to be monic. So we'll define the square free factorization as the unique list of monic square free polynomials, G1 up to GM, M is as big as it needs to be. Um, if F were square free to start with, M would be one. And we want the last polynomial in our list is to be non-trivial. And then F needs to be equal to the product of G1, the square of G2, dot, 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 up to the nth power of G sub M, okay? And so if we compute this square free factorization, the nice thing is that we then are left with polynomials G1 up to GM that we know are square free and we can run our distinct rational roots algorithm on them. And then we also know that the multiplicity of the roots of say, you know, G, GI is I. And so if I, if I when I, after I, find all the rational roots of G2, I know immediately what their multiplicity is because I've already computed the square free factorization. 
And the algorithm for computing the square free factorization is based, is based on sort of a very simple fact, which is that if I have, uh, if I consider the factorization of a polynomial over a perfect field into irreducibles, and you know, finite fields are perfect fields, I'm going to get a repeated factor if and only if that factor divides the GCD of F with its derivative, its formal derivative. Again, this is not hard to prove. There's proof in the notes if you want to look at it. And then Young's algorithm um, is very sim simple. Um, maybe I'm, I'm realizing I'm, I'm uh, running a bit long on time here, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the details. I'll just note that it's simple. It's easy to prove that it works uh, by induction, and it's very fast. The only thing it's doing is it's, compu it's, taking G it's computing derivatives and taking GCDs. There's no exponentiations in, in this algorithm. And so it, gives, it will yield the square free factorization in time that's quasi-linear in the product of n and d. And you really can't hope to do any better because it takes n times d bits just to write f down. So this is a quasi-linear time algorithm in the size of its input. OK. And the key point is that since there's not an n squared here, there's just an n, this is asymptotically negligible compared to the time it takes to run distinct rational roots. So there's really no re reason to just not run square free factorization on, on every input to distinct rational roots first. And, and then we'll automatically know the multiplicity of all the roots up front. And you might say, well, maybe that's a waste of time if, if our polynomial happens to be irreducible. Well, yeah, but it's a little low of one waste of time. And any time our input polynomial is not square free, sorry, not, it doesn't have to be irreducible, it needs to be square free. Anytime it's not square free, we'll actually speed things up by computing the square free factorization first. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this. What have I done here? Oh, I didn't define the algorithm. I'm going to compile the algorithm. Run this. So what I'm doing here is I've just taken, I've constructed H as a product of ith powers of quadratic polynomials. And then I've gone ahead and computed the square free factorization. Um, it took, you'll see, almost no time, just about a millisecond. I mean, if you wanted to see what um, the square free factorization looked like. It's just a list of polynomials. So it's, um, I've included uh, a zero with element just because Python index is erased by zero. This is always gonna be set to one. And then the first entry in the, in the array, this quadratic divides our polynomial H to the first power. This one divides it to the second power and so on. So this was a degree, I guess, 45 polynomial. It computes the over, uh, uh, to the 61 minus one, and it computes the square free factorization very quickly. Okay, so now that we know how to compute square free factorization, we can put together, combine this with our distinct rational roots function um, to completely factor, or sorry, to find all of the rational roots of a polynomial together with their multiplicity. That's the function factor roots, and the algorithm just computes the square free factorization and then calls distinct rational roots for each of the polynomials in the square, each of the square free polynomials in the square free factorization, and then just notes the appropriate multiplicity of the root of its roots. So we could go ahead and run this on just say a, a random product of linear polynomials, and it quickly finds all the factors and records their multiplicities. Okay. Great. So now you know everything you need to know about finding roots of polynomials over finite fields. Um, in fact, this is essentially optimal. No algorithm is known that is better than this. There, there are a few things you can fiddle with around the edges if you want to optimize algorithm for computing square roots or roots of degree three or four polynomials, say using solvent solutions by radicals. But those are all very minor constant factor improvements. In terms of the asymptotics, we don't know any algorithm that's faster than the very simple algorithm we just wrote down, at least when for a large, um, when it's in large characteristic. Okay. All right. So we've been, I've been focusing on finding the FQ rational roots, but of course, as we noted at the beginning, this Raven's algorithm will find roots over whatever field extension of FQ you want. So you could use this as a factorization algorithm. You could actually, by finding roots over extension fields and then taking minimal polynomials or just multiplying them together, you could construct a factorization. Um, 
So this was noted by Rabin in, in his original paper, but so, shortly after Rabin's 1980 paper came out in 1981, Cantor and Sassenhaus um, noted that, um, yes, this is using randomness is a great idea, but for, if you want to factor your polynomial into irreducibles, you don't want to do that by computing roots over extension fields. Um, and there's really no reason to do any work over extension fields. I mean, your output is over your base field. And if you think about it, the irreducible factors of your polynomial really correspond to Galois orbits of roots over extension fields. And it's always better to just work with the Galois, Galois orbit as an object in its own right, rather than go, uh, extending up to this field. Okay, so how is this going to work? Well, can't, the cantor house innovation really applies sort of to the hard part of, of, of Raven's algorithm where randomness is required. It's focused on the splitting up polynomials that we know are products of irreducible polynomials of the same degree. But, so let's first put ourselves in that situation. And we do that by computing what's known as the distinct degree factorization. So this is uh, the factorization of F into polynomials, say G1 up to G sub one up to G sub D where each G sub I is a product of irreducible polynomials of degree I. So some of these G sub I's may be equal to one, but, but I'm not ruling that out. Just define this as a list of D polynomials where each of them we know is a product of irreducibles of the same degree. Okay, and the key point is we already know how to do this. We can, just, we can do this just by taking GCDs with X to the Q to the I minus X. As long as we're careful to pull out um, roots that we know as we go. Okay. So how is this going, going to work? Well, we're going to do the same thing we do we uh, did in the first step of Rabin's algorithm, take a, a, a GCD with X. The first step would be to take a GCD with X to the Q minus X. That's going to be the product of all the linear factors. That's going to be our G sub one. And then we're going to remove that product from F. And then we know that all the irreducible factors of what's left are going to have degree two or greater. And if we focus on the degree two ones and remove those, we can then continue in that fashion. But it's going to be um, very useful to use the square free factorization in the process of doing that. Because when we, when we want to do this process of removing the factors we already know, if they're repeated factors, we don't want to have to waste time trying to figure out what their multiplicity is. So we'll compute. So in general, we're going to compute the square free factorization first, and then compute the distinct degree factorization. So I've set this up just so you can see what the naive, naive distinct degree factorization is. If you wanted to match it up with this definition, it will do the stupid thing and compute the square free factorization and then multiply things together to get a result that matches this definition. But in practice, what you would do is you would only call the distinct degree factorization function with a polynomial that you already knew was square free. And in that scenario, you'd set the square free flag to true. And so let's assume, let's now look at the algorithm in that situation, which is how we're going to use it in our complete factorization algorithm. We're going to take our um, input polynomial F, which we're now assuming is square free. Okay. We're going to initialize an array of polynomials to just all be po the trivial polynomials one. So we're initially setting G1 through G sub D up to one. And then we're gonna go through for each degree and at each step, we're going to construct this distinct degree poly polynomial. This is the GCD of F with X to the Q to the I minus X. And so let's just imagine we're running through this in the first step where I is one, two times I is probably not gonna be greater than the degree. Let's ignore that for the moment. We're then going to compute the same polynomial we computed in Rabin's algorithm, the GCD with F with X to the Q minus X. And then we're going to divide F by that, the product of all the linear factors of F. And since F is square free, we know that what's left in F is, F is now a product of irreducibles of degree two or greater. And as we iterate through this, we then do the same thing and remove all the degree two factors, then all the degree three, et cetera. There may be layers in which we don't remove anything because distinct degree poly might return, might return one if there are no polynomial, if there are no factors of degree I. Okay, coming back to this if condition here, this is just a bit of cleverness that once we get up high enough, if we now, if we're at a point where we're looking for irreducible factors whose degree is greater than twice the degree of F, 
we know we must be done. There's only one, the F must be irreducible at that point because we've removed all the lower degree factors. And then we can just skip to the end. There's no reason to set each element of this array. We already initialized it to one. We'll just set the one remaining irreducible that's left. So the degree of F, enter that uh, using that as an index of the array, set that to F. Okay. So this is the discrete distinct degree factorization function. This is just a demonstration function that shows you if you really wanted to compute the discrete distinct degree factorization outside the scope of, of the cantor zassen house algorithm where you're not computing the square free factorization first, you could use this to compute the distinct degree factorization. And just to demonstrate this, I'm gonna note that once, now that we know how to compute the distinct degree factorization, distinct degree factorization, if we combine that with the square free degree, square free factorization, we can completely determine the factorization pattern of our polynomial and implement one of my favorite functions, fact, affectionately known as factpat, which tells me how F splits. It tells me what, uh, what the degrees of all the irreducible factors of F are. And the way factpat works is it first computes the square free factorization and then it computes the distinct degree factorization of each uh, polynomial in our square free factorization and then it adjusts multiplicities appropriately. Oops, let's go ahead and run this on our degree eight polynomial. And, and recall that we had, excuse me, let's just print out F here to remind us what it is. Um, and we could even, yeah, so now we're over, uh, We're over FP, where P is to the 61 minus one. So this is our polynomial and it factors as a linear factor, two quadratic factors and a cubic factor. But even if we didn't have a factorization algorithm, FactPat would have already told us that. FactPat is saying it has a linear factor, two quadratic factors and one cubic factor. Um, let's try maybe a more complicated example. I'm gonna construct a polynomial that I know has a bunch of factors of different degrees, including some repeated factors. So this is my um, polynomial H. This is the output, this dictionary here is the output of FactPad. It's saying there are 20 degree one factors and 15 degree two factors. And here I've actually used Sage's factorization uh, function to compute the degrees of the factorizations. And if you count them up, they'll match what FactPad uh, already told us. And the point I want to emphasize is that FactPad is a deterministic algorithm. There's no randomness here. We were never trying to split anything. We're just using GCDs. We use GCDs to get the square free factorization using Young's algorithm. And then we took GCDs to get the distinct, distinct degree factorization to split um, F up into products of irreducible polynomials of the same degree. Okay. Okay, so now for the cantor zassen house algorithm. So if we actually want to compute the full factorization of F, we're left with the problem of splitting a polynomial that we know is a product of, uh, is a square free product of irreducible factors, polynomials of the same degree, say degree J. And so the, the neat idea that Cantor and Sassenhaus had was instead of taking GCD with um, the polynomial that Rabin used, X plus delta to the S minus one, with a random delta, which maybe lives over an extension field. This is how we, what we would do. We would take the degree J extension field if we were looking for a root um, that lives over degree J extension and the minimal polynomial of that root would then be an irreducible factor of degree J. But Cantor and Sassenhaus note that it's much better to just compute U to the S minus one where U is just some random polynomial mod F. So we take any, any polynomial of degree strictly less than F I mean, these are exactly the elements that Sage would use to represent the quotient ring by F in any case. <clears throat> and because we're working in, um, we've reduced ourselves to the situation where we're working with a product of distinct irreducible factors of the same degree, the Chinese remainder theorem tells us that this quotient looks like just a, is just isomorphic to a product of degree J extensions of FQ. And there are R of them where R is the number of irreducible polynomials. So the degree of F would be R times J here. And the key point is that picking a, a random polynomial U and plugging, if we imagine plugging it into the reduction map and uh, given to us by the Chinese remainder theorem, we're effectively picking random elements of each of these finite fields that are in this factor. 
And we, all we need to do is hope that we hit um, plus one in in either in one case and, and minus one in a, another case. We just don't want to have all the results be um, plus one or all the results be minus one. And so this is just computing the probability that happens. And I'm noticing a typo, which I'm going to fix. I wrote x plus delta. That was copied from the corresponding theorem for Raven's algorithm, but now I want it to be u to the s minus one. So what this theorem is saying is that the probability that we get a, no, a non-trivial splitting. We find, we take a GCD of F, which is a product of irreducible polynomials of degree J with the polynomial U to the S minus one, where S is gonna be um, Q to the J minus one over two. We have at least a 50-50 chance of splitting F. And the, the probability increases as the degree of F increases. The more irreducible factors it, ha it has, the harder it is for them all to get lucky and hit the same value of plus or minus one in every factor. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at the algorithm. So this is our equal degree factorization. This is really the heart of the algorithm where, where we've used the square free factorization algorithm and the distinct degree factorization algorithm to put us in a situation where the input F here is a, a monic polynomial that's known to be the product of distinct irreducible polynomials of degree J. So let D be the degree of F, in particular, D better be divisible by J. We verify that here. Now, in order to set this up to be used inside our, our other function, we, we want to handle the trivial case where F is actually a constant. And in that case, it has meaning it's, it's degree zero. In that case, it has no, it's easy to compute its factorization. It's trivial, just the empty list. It could also happen that F has degree exactly equal to J. And since we're assuming it's a product of irreducible polynomials of degree J, if it has to reach A, it must be irreducible itself. And we can just return its factorization of itself being irreducible. Okay, but now we're in the case where R is greater than two. So we're exactly in the setting of this theorem here. We have at least two distinct irreducible factors of degree J. We're gonna set S to be Q to the J minus one over two. Okay, but we're not actually going to be working in, in, the, in the finite field FQ to the J, even though the, where you were exploiting this isomorphism, we're doing all of our computations over FQ. Okay. okay, so we set up our quotient map pi sub F, that's gonna put us into this ring here, in which the Chinese remainder theorem is, tells us is secretly simulating our copies of FQ to the J. Now, in order to um, make our lives easier, in order to ensure that u to the s is either plus or minus one and not zero, we want u to be co-prime to f. And so we're, how, are we, how do we do that? Well, we're gonna, first we generate our random u, we just um, pick an array, a vector of d coefficients, the d is the degree of f, um, but d f has, no, it has d plus one coefficients. If we take a vector of d coefficients, we can just plug that into the ring for F, our, our polynomial ring over FQ, which is just F parent. And Sage knows that if you give it a list of coefficients, it should just form the polynomial. So this U is gonna be a random polynomial of degree less than F. And to make sure it's co-prime, well, we're gonna check. We're gonna take the GCD with F. And you might say, we're, you know, think we're hoping it's trivial, but actually we're hoping it's non-trivial because if we get lucky, maybe it's not co-prime, in which case we've just found a non-trivial factor of, of F because U has a uh, degree less than F. So in that case, you know, we celebrate um, and then we use the polynomial we just found to split up into two parts and then we recursively factor each of those parts. That will very rarely happen if we're working over a large finite field. So in the typical case, we're now in a position set up to use U to split F um, by computing U to, U to the S minus one using our usual trick of reducing to the quotient ring, exponentiating there, then lifting and then taking the GCD and we we're successful whenever our GCD is a non-trivial factor of F, meaning its degree is um, strictly between zero and the degree of F. And anytime we get a splitting, we're then going in a position to just recursively factor each of the H and F over H. And notice F was a product of degree J, irreducible degree J polynomials. So both of the factors, both at H and F over H are also products of degree J, irreducible polynomials. Okay. So just to put it all together, to give us our final algorithm factorization, which is going to 
completely factor any polynomial over any finite field, say of odd characteristic, although it's easy to generalize this algorithm to the even characteristic cases, only very minor modifications. We proceed as, as follows. We first make sure our polynomial is not constant and we make it monic if we need to. And then we're going to set up res is going to be the result of our factorization. This is going to be a list of pairs of a polynomial and then the multiplicity of an uh, irreducible polynomial and the multiplicity of that irreducible polynomial as a factor of f. And then the first step is to compute the square free factorization. So at this point, as soon as we've done that, we completely know what all the multiplicities are going to be. There's no mystery about those. And then we proceed to compute the distinct degree factorization of each polynomial in the square free factorization. And then for each polynomial in the distinct degree factorization, we're going to apply our equal degree factorization algorithm. And then this is where the cantor zassenhaus trick of taking random polynomials u comes in inside the equal degree factorization. That returns a list of polynomials. And we know the list eventually returned by equal degree factorization. These are all going to be polynomials of degree j. They're irreducible polynomials of degree j. And we know that um, because we did our square free factorization up front, we know they divide f with multiplicity i. Yeah. So we just put in g comma i into our set of results. And then at the end, even though our algorithm is randomized, we'd like it to have a canonical output so that no matter what polynomial, if we put the same polynomial in twice, we always get the same output. This is also important if we want to compare the results um, with other algorithms, like say Sage's algorithm. So we're going to just sort them. Sage is smart enough to sort um, and a, a list of tuples of polynomials and integers. Okay. All right. So now let's go ahead and um, run the algorithm and compare the results with Sage. So factorization f, f here is our, our running example, our degree eight polynomial, and I've printed the factorization, but before I even printed it, I first verified that the factorization of f given by the, the function we just implemented is the same as the factorization computed by Sage using the factor method. I'm just sorting the results Sage gives because this, the, the Sage order is not always the same as, as, as our sort order. And I can also compare the running times of the two algorithms. I could, I could factor the polynomial f with our algorithm, say factor it 70 times, take the, the, the average over seven runs of 10 loops each, and it's something like five milliseconds. That's not as fast as Sage, but you know, no surprise there. We're, we're implementing this in Python. Underneath the cover, Sage is, is calling C code to do this factorization. Um, but it's not dramatically slower either. Okay? I mean, so this is still a, a perfectly reasonable, reasonably fast algorithm for factoring a degree eight polynomial over uh, word size prime. Um, I'll write it again. Let's see there the results. We could also try um, our, our more complicated polynomial H, um, which had a bunch of linear factors and a bunch of quadratic factors. <clears throat> and again, you can see um, uh, that it runs uh, quite quickly. And, and what is the complexity of the algorithm? Well, um, the, the, it's spelled out in excruciating detail in the notes, but if you don't want to, if your eyes glaze over when you see too many log factors, just remember it's, it's very easy to understand in soft O notation. It's just quasi-quadratic in N, the size of our finite field, and quasi-quadratic in D, the degree of the polynomial we're trying to factor. Now I should say there are other algorithms that can do better. Um, there, there are algorithms that use linear algebra, um, over finite fields, in particular the Shoup and Kaltofen algorithm. And then the fastest known algorithm actually uses a technique known as modular composition. This is due to Kitlaya Umans. And it's actually able to get the exponent on D down to three halves. So its complexity is roughly D to the three halves times N plus DN squared. But notice the N squared never goes away. That's present, always present. And if D is small, like if D, if we're just trying to find uh, cube roots, say, or, or, or uh, factor a polynomial of a fixed degree, the, the important term here is the, uh, the important factor here is n squared. And that's the same as for, um, as in Raven's root finding algorithm. And it's essentially the cost of exponentiation. 